Ladies and gentlemen, this is Sunil Sanghai. I am the chairman of the Capital Markets Committee of FICI. Welcome to this very special session on interaction with a leading global investor who has made significant commitments to India. As you may know, CDPQ has not only been investing in India for the last five years, but also has a beautiful office in New Delhi under the leadership of Anita George. India is one of their 10 large offices around the world. CDPQ has so far invested almost 5 billion US dollars in the last five years, helped build multiple businesses, multiple infrastructure projects, and I'm sure this is just the beginning. Ladies and gentlemen, we couldn't have had a better person than Mr. Mark Andre Blanchard. Executive Vice President and Head of CDPQ Global to share his perspective with us. Mr. Blanchard is responsible for CDPQ's three main regional operations outside of Canada, United States, Latin America, Europe, and Asia Pacific. Before joining CDPQ in September 2020, he was the ambassador and permanent representative of Canada at the United Nations in New York from 2016 to 2020. Mark Andre, a very warm welcome to you to India, virtually though. I also welcome you to FICI and its leading capital markets conference, CAPM 2021. This is the flagship capital markets conference in India. So, well, thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and thank you, uh, Mr. Sange, uh, it's a pleasure to be here and to actually, I look forward to uh, go very, very soon physically in India. Uh, as you mentioned, CDPQ um, is, um, is, you know, is a, one of the lead investors uh, from Canada and from the world in India. And we're very happy to be there. We've, uh, we've grown tremendously in the last five years and uh, our intention is to go, to grow even further. In the, obviously in the coming five years. So we're very excited at the prospect of uh, our relationship uh, with, um, you know, with the Indian government, with the Indian partners that we have. And uh, we were really, really blessed uh, to, to have developed phenomenal partnerships uh, with, uh, with Indian partners to, to, you know, whether it's in the financial services sector, um, uh, with uh, Kotak or Piramal or whether it's in the renewable industry uh, with Azure Power or CLP um, and and I, I could go on and on and and so we are looking forward to to develop further. Mark Andre, as you well know, in the current circumstances, every conversation starts with a pandemic and end with a pandemic. So before we start our conversation on the capital markets, let me come to the pandemic straight away. I would like to hear your views on the role of global organizations like CDPQ in the post-pandemic era. Well, Sunil, I, it, it's, it's, it's very interesting. Uh, the, the pandemic has changed a lot of things, obviously, because um, I think, but 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 I would say the biggest chain is the acceleration, because what we now see um, in the middle of the pandemic or coming out of the pandemic, um, it, it, you, you know, we saw it before the pandemic. You know, the, the 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 risks. You know, what are the main two risks that the planet is facing for its sustainability or for its security? It's all about the fight against climate change and the need then does the need for a transition and then the issue of inequalities we we know that the inequalities we see in the world are unsustainable and are a threat to actually our 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 our, our, our security worldwide and what we saw through the pandemic it's an acceleration of those threats we saw that you know we're only as strong as the weakest link uh, in, in, you know, whether it's in, in even in, within Canada, you know, the most, uh, you know, like the, really the most at risk areas for the pandemic were 
actually areas where, where the, the inequalities were wider. Uh, and then you look at it um, within regions or within countries and you see it. And the world will only be safe wherever, when everyone, you know, where everywhere on the planet will be able to have enough vaccinated people and will, you know, will have uh, um, combat successfully this virus. And the same thing with climate change. Climate change know of no borders. And, um, it, you know, and, and, and we're all in this together and we all need to work together like never before. And I think that's, the, you know, if you ask me in the pandemic, uh, you know, what we saw, uh, we saw that actually women in particular in, in a country like Canada, and I'm sure it's probably the same thing in Asia, in India, it's, it's, it's actually, if you're a woman, you're twice as likely to more, or more likely to have lost your job than if you're a man. And, 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 and so, so this fragility is, is just come, has been, we knew there was a fragility there before uh, for the inclusive, inclusion of women in the workplace. But, and, but, but now we realize that this pandemic has, has you know, shown the fragility and we, we must work better at it uh, to, to make sure that we get the diverse workforce that we all need. And, and that actually that we make the progress throughout the world uh, to fight inequalities and, and climate change. Mark Andre, you have a unique combination of an insider and an outsider. You have been a part of the government as an ambassador, and now you lead a significant commercial organization. How do you see, and you touched upon the partnership in your opening comment, how do you see a partnership between the government and the private sector progressing, particularly post-pandemic era? And so, not only yes. in India, but around the world, I just, in India, we call it as public-private partnership, PPP. Uh, that's the concept we have here. So let me give you one example. I actually believe that, the, in, well, let's just make this statement that business as usual, as usual will not work to address the challenges we need to address now in the world. Yeah. We know this. On the other hand, we, we, know, we know that there's enough capital to actually face the challenges that we, are, that we need to address in this world. We also know that, that so that, that you know, like what we need to be doing now, and I actually believe that's a lesson of the partner of the of the of the of the pandemic. We need to create partnerships that are different. We need to be more innovative in the way we think about how do to do things. The private sector and the public sectors together, and then sometimes with some stakeholders. And and the, you know. The, 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 we know that the private sector cannot do it alone, but the public pr sector cannot do it alone either. And But we know that in countries like India and Canada, the United States of America, Europe, it's the private sector that owns the capital to actually make things happen. This is It's the private sector that has, that for the most part, create the innovation and brings the resources and the talent to all of this and in many ways. And so, we need to do things differently. I'll give you an example of, of our own institution. A, a few years ago, we sat down with the Quebec government. There was an issue of, of transportation, public transportation around Montreal, in particular between the main airport and our downtown area in Montreal. And there was a, a you know, what, what, what happened is there was the creation of very special partnership and a different role for an institutional investors like CDPQ we have created what we call the ram and it's it's actually a light rail train that will be that has been designed that will be operated well that is being built that will be operated that will be owned by cdpq an institutional investor so imagine an institutional investor owning managing building uh, you know having designed a public infrastructure like a rate light rail train Ten years ago, that was unthinkable, but now this is a reality. And and actually, it needed a partnership 
between an institutional investor, the Infrastructure Bank of Canada, the government of Quebec, the, uh, the supplier of, um, of, of, of electricity, an agreement with the municipalities where the train will go. So it's a completely different way of looking at how at opportunities and how we do things. And, you know, a lot of people are, are you know, I'm part of the, of the people who believe there are tremendous opportunities coming out of this situation, the current situation we're in. I was at the G7 as a representative of the business leaders of the, the private sector. It was the first time since early 2000 that the private sector, that the, the G7 leaders met with some um, leaders of the private sector from some G7 countries under the leadership of, uh, of Prince Charles and Brian Monaghan from the, C the CEO of Bank of America. And we look at, if you look at what came out of the G7 and what is about to come out of, of the G20, it's actually, uh, uh, the, 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 in the G7 uh, communique, there's never been more mentions of PPPs. Uh, of public-private partnership than than we've seen now. There's never been uh, mentions of the role of the need for a role of the private sector that that we see now. You know, just think about. I'll give you some idea. It's about scaling up investment in technology and infrastructure to facilitate the clean transition or green transition from coal. Uh, a green transition in transportation. The agenda of decarbonization is huge, huge. They just think about the decarbonization of mobility, um, you know, the scaling up of, uh, of zero emission vehicle technology and buses, trains, shipping, aviation, uh, the decarbonization of iron, of steel, cement, the chemicals, the petrochemicals, the acceleration on, uh, of, of progress on technology, on on what is needed on electrification, on batteries, on hydrogen, on carbon capture, um, the aviation and the shipping. So these are all things that, you know, like just uh, that huge opportunities, but we cannot do it the old way. We all need to work together like never before. So for me, it's all about partnerships. And I say to the private sector people who listen to us, we all need each other. Some of us think we're competitors, but we're not competitors. We uh, we bring com maybe we were competitors in the past. Maybe there are some parts of our business where we compete, but there are a lot of parts where we can also leverage each other and 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 work together. And I think we need to be a bit you know really innovative in our approach. And uh, and for us, that was the idea of what we did in the city of Montreal. Like you know, never before. Uh, an institutional investor had been doing that in Canada. We did that, and I think it's the first of many other projects we will do. And I think this is a model, you know, the, the model on this um, on this light rail train that I've talked about. It's an interesting one because the the what has happened is the way it's built. It's actually the public sector has accepted that uh, the, 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 the 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 we would have a priority returns. And so, so of course, we're we're an institutional investors. We're there. We have a fiduciary obligation with respect to the pensioners, uh, the pe the workers of the province of Quebec. And so, we need to provide a return. We're not there for philanthropy, but there's a way to think about it. There's a way to say, okay, how we can all you know look at the results and try to get to the results rather than you know focusing on on you know, of the old process of getting there. We need to start, you know, uh, the chairman of Moderna is a friend of mine, uh, Nubara Fayan, and, and he told me, you know, you need to start about to think about the problems you're trying to solve rather than the way to get there. You know, just think out of the box. Think about the solution you're trying to create and then you'll get there. And he told me that many years before, <laughs> before the, 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 you know that he was able to develop the variant, uh, the, the variant, the vaccine for the for the virus for COVID, and you know he was right. Uh, you know, like he was thinking differently, and this is why, you know, thank God we had people like Nubara Fayan really to save us in some ways from this uh, COVID issue. And uh, but thinking differently, and you know, seeing processes differently, and partnership differently.
you know, that's very well put. I think compete but collaborate. I think that's a good takeaway uh, for this. Uh, let me move to India now quickly. As you know, we are an emerging economy and therefore we focus on higher growth and that's not very easy to achieve, particularly for us, which is a large democratic country. Uh, what do you think? Is there anything which you can suggest to facilitate further growth? Because the growth is important for, for us. Well, I think, you know, it's, 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 it's a very tough question for me to answer, and I'm not sure I'm the best one to answer this, because I think India, as uh, you're doing a lot of very, very good things, and um, you've, uh, I have so much admiration for the country, and I say it from the bottom of my heart and in a very sincere way. And I think, uh, you know, what has been accomplished in India in recent years is uh, really uh, exceptional by any standard. I think it's actually, if, if I had one personal wish, is, is coming back to this idea of partnership. We all need to trust each other and to work well with each other. We already do. We've invested, you know, in your countries more than $5 billion over the last five years. So there's a lot of trust. There's a lot of partnerships that have been developed, but we need to accelerate this even more. And we need to, to be very, uh, you know, th there are some, a little bit like Warren Buffett says sometimes, you know, there are some, it's a new world, but some of the old rules uh, and, and what we've learned from the past is also very useful for the future. So, so uh, you know, it, the, the, the very, very, uh, you know, like solid financial um, structures are, are needed. Uh, you know, we need to, 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 we need good foundations for a deal. We need good partnerships. We need a good regulatory framework. We need um, access to the, you know, good legal framework, good rule of law. We need a good governance inside the company, but with also with communities. We need it's it, and it's it. This is was a message. This is not a message that is very special to India, but this is the message we brought. The business community brought to the G7 leaders recently that I referred to earlier. We said to the G7 leaders, you know, you're facing this problem of inequality and climate change. The answer is 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 a massive, rapid build of infrastructure to address a lot of the issues that we've talked about. The private sector, we said the private sector is there. We have resources, we have the innovation, but we need from you, G7 leaders, to make sure that we have the right legal framework for PPPs, that we have, that you create the right conditions for the private sector to play the role. And that actually the, the, the governments also all over the planet need to work better with the private sector in Canada, as in, in the United States of America, as in Europe, as in India. And, 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 and I must say on this, we've had a very good relationship with the government of India and Prime Minister Modi, who has been incredibly good for, uh, you know, to actually, and, and, and actually very, uh, has been action oriented and to make sure that, you know, the conditions um, to, to, to invest were there. And, uh, and so it, we, we just need to continue to work that way. And um, there's, there's, there's a bit of an urgency to act and to all over the planet, uh, whether you're in India or in Canada or in the United States. And, uh, and so that's, uh, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's still a macro, uh, you know, answer to your question that was more micro, but I think this is, this is how I see it. Um, uh, whether you're in India or elsewhere, I think it, it, the same kind of rules and parameters um, are there. For us in in India, we 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 think that you know, for example, the issue of energy is a very important one. We see a lot of opportunities. You have 38% of your energy that comes from renewable. 
the demand for energy will grow by 300 percent by 2040 i think and then and then but you need to go through the transition from coal to 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 other um sources of energy quickly as well so so you know uh, you have that as a goal you you have your program that was launched in 2020 of 1.4 trillion dollars of uh, investment in infrastructure so we you know we we now have uh, in renewables in india we have 1.8 uh, gigawatt in operations and we have 5.3 gigawatt that are in, under construction we want to do more and and for us there's a there's i want to say so you have those objectives in india this necessity to go through the transition and to produce uh, you know clean energy quickly but also for us we have a, we have a very ambitious plan to uh, uh, of a goal by 2025 to reduce our our our, our carbon footprint around the world by 25 percent so it's aligned with what we're trying to do to actually develop and accelerate the development of partnership in the renewable industry in india that's an example yeah i totally agree with you that medicine is the same um, it's, it's applicable to around the world applicable to india also but i want to quickly pick up the thread on the last point which you made, which is uh, sustainable financing um, uh, and ESG related points. And I know it is very, very close to your heart. Uh, so is with for us. Uh, we have been a big believer in sustainable finance. And I know CDPQ and you have taken a leadership in that. India is fully committed to this cause. Uh, in fact, we have a panel discussion on this topic later today at this event. Um, what are your views on that, on sustainable finance? How could Canada help and CDBQ can help in that? You know, I, I, it's a very good question, Sunil. I was thinking when, when I was listening to you, the, the most simple way of how I would put it, I would say it's so important, sustainable finance, that in actually, you know, a lot of people talk about impact investing and that sort of thing. Yeah. I actually believe within the next five to 10 years, we won't be talking about impact investing or we won't be talking about sustainable finance because that will be the norm. That will be the normal. Yeah. And, and if you're an investor for the long term, like CDPQ, you need to make sure that actually your investment that you make now is sustainable for the next 30 years. You know, we're not short-term investor. And, and so what, is, what will the world look like in 10 years, 20 years, 30 years is very important to us, not only as citizens and not only because we do it because we want to have to deliver a world that is, is great for our children. Yes, we do that for that, but we do that because it's in our own interest. It's, it is totally aligned with our financial interest. Yeah. We need to invest in, 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 in infrastructure and in products and companies that are sustainable and will be there for the long run. And, and I believe that only those who are, will, you know, contribute to the transition that will actually respect ESG principles in all sorts of ways that actually you cannot build an infrastructure without actually having the social license from the community to operate. 20 years ago, you were not talking really about that. Now it's an essential part of the investment. Uh, and, and, and then you could go on and on and on about all sorts of things. You know, even if you are, I, you know, in the, with social media now, I mean, just think about that in the U S more than a third of the consumers are boycotting a brand based on ESG principles. Yeah. Look at the mini millennials. I, more than 75% of them are willing to pay more to have greener products. I mean, this is, this is where, it, so the market is asking for it as well. And the pressure, we get pressure from our depositors to actually 
have a greener portfolio, have a portfolio that respect ESG principles, that, uh, that we have, uh, give you an example, uh, uh, diversity in the governance of companies we invest in. It's very important. Like the, and the world has moved there, whether you're in India, Canada, or in Europe, it's the same thing. And the, the youth are aspiring to the same thing. The, you know, and it's uh, the millennials will actually vote with their, with their not only, uh, you know, like it will be with their money, with how they consume. And, and, and if, we, if we don't think about that, that will be, uh, you know, there will be, so that's one aspect. And the other aspect, obviously, is the issue of, uh, uh, you know, back to the same issues of, of, of inequalities and of the, of the need to quickly, quickly uh, fight uh, climate change. Um, so that's, that's the, so when you talk about sustainable finance, I think, you know, investors like us are thinking about it a lot. I think you are uh, all in the look at the, the program that of your agenda, but also, as I said, you know, where, the, where we need to act differently, all of us, and we need to think about. So, for example, I'll give you an example um, from a public, you know, people from the government that are listening to us. The, the government needs to see the role of the private sector slightly differently than what they've seen bef before. I'll give you an example. In, you know, we had this discussion again with the G7 leaders. They were asking if institutional investors, if financial institutions were willing to do more in some uh, uh, some you know frontier markets. Well, you know we need to all collaborate in a different way to make this happen. Like you know, um, and, and 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 we need instruments. Like we need to work better to develop projects. We need to work together better to develop the capacity to develop projects that are bankable and that are feasible and that are accepted by communities. We need to, to actually find ways to, to, to de-risk ourselves in some issue, in some context. And sometimes the de-risking is only about knowledge. You know, when an investor doesn't know about uh, something, they tend to actually um, overestimate the, the, the risk and underestimate the opportunities. So there's a lot of that, that actually what I'm asking the, the more the public sector to help us is, is to do that. And 75 years ago, just think about when the Washington institutions were put together, the World Bank, the IMF, the, 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 you know, the, the institutional investors like us did not exist. Um, you know, we were not talking about emerging markets. The role of India was totally different 75 years ago than now. And, 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 and so we need to act differently and those institutions need to act differently. Um, I'll tell you, I think the World Bank, I'm, I'm a big believer that needs to be a big reform of the World Bank. The World Bank should become a supporter, a catalyst, but not think that they, they have the preeminent role of, of investors. I mean, because it, it's important, the World Bank should become a place where, you know, a McKinsey of infrastructure where they prepare projects and then the private sector comes in and actually do uh, all sorts of, uh, but that's, you know, that's uh, not the purpose of our discussion, but that's how I see how we need to move um, in a very different way than what uh, we've done so far. No, I totally agree. I like, your analogy to say that going forward, this will be the norm and not an exception. So that's how it will move. Uh, finally, and also changing the track a bit, uh, uh, I, I must say, Mark Andre, uh, I watched your a very interesting interview on Bloomberg. Um, and there are a number of themes which you address there. One of the themes which really fascinated me was your views on globalization. Um, and I, I couldn't stop myself. I thought I would request you to share your views here with the audience. The, well, you know, I don't think, like some people are asking whether globalization will be slowed down 
or uh, in case in, in, in coming out of this pandemic. I, I am a believer that, um, they, that it will be different, but not necessarily slowed down. And I believe like you, you have, um, you know, you, you have a different focus on supply chains maybe than we've had before. I think, and that's where I think the partnerships will be key going forward. Um, we need, we need more. I mean, I was in Europe uh, a few weeks ago at the Choose France, an event in, uh, organized by President Macron for foreign investors. And, and they were, you know, France was, uh, President Macron was talking about the, there was no saying on one hand, there's no place for nationalism in economics, in trade. And on the other hand, though, and that was the, 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 the there will be a need for calibration of that. On the other hand, they were talking a lot about the necessity to build some European supply chain in some very specific areas. Whether they will be successful or not, that's not the point, is that actually we cannot, I believe globalization is there to stay, will remain, but will be done slightly differently. What we need to avoid in this case is the rise of protectionism. That's why the World Trade Organization is so key. And I'm, I'm very excited with the new president, and I'm in Guzzi. Dr. Nguzi is, is, is a phenomenal person. She, and I, she will be able to, to, to I think, uh, uh, you know, gather consensus or at least try to convene and get to gather some consensus about some but but we cannot put our hands in the sand our heads in the sand either that the, the pandemic has has changed the as it doesn't change it's it's again a signal you know populism existed before the pandemic and some fear about some supply chains was the it was there before the pandemic it has only been put on a on the microscope, a microscope during the pandemic, and that's what you're going to see. So you're going to see some, in the, in I think, for example, you'll have more regional organization of supply chains. But let's all work together to make it the exception, and make sure that the, you know we all benefit uh, from having very clear trade rules that are respected, and we all benefit from a freer flow of goods rather than a more going back to 40 years ago where there was less free trade and all of that the the mistake we made in in maybe in the past and i was i was part of a, i was a very young intern that the, when when for example the uh, us canada mexico uh, trade agreement when nafta was negotiated in 1991 and uh, I, 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 at the time, I'm come from the generation that we all uh, were a very big fan of free trade, and maybe our mistake was to not uh, be, be clear or ac admit there were some losers, losers or, uh, like in that there were some people that were losing uh, in 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 the in in the equation. And and so it is important to understand that, like in in America, we've seen that like the results of the last two elections reflect that. that there's a need. So and and it's the same thing in Europe. And it was palpable last week with President Macron. There's a need to calibrate this. That I think everybody recognize. Most people recognize that we're better off in a free trade world with the rules that are clear. Uh, that you know hopefully in some can be enforced and all of that. But on the other hand, we need to understand that as we've seen during the pandemic, the, the, the supply chains were at sometimes, you know, at threats, under threats. And we also need to understand that there are some people that are have lost uh, in some in societies, particularly in countries like like in some corners of Europe and some corners of America. And we need to, you know, there's a transition still to be going through. And uh, but I'm I'm very hopeful um, that um, we will be able to to manage this. I think it takes some it takes some leadership, and it takes a lot of 
we need to spend more time. Um, uh, maybe I spent too much time at the UN, and we, you know, I, I I started to appreciate the fact that just getting together and talking to each other was a victory. But I actually I, I believe a lot in this, and uh, and that's uh, that's why I'm also uh, very very I was very excited uh, by the invitation, your invitation, Sunil, and the invitation of Fiki today. Mark Andre, we really appreciate your taking the time out uh, to talk to us and participate at this very important event. I do know that this is a vacation time and you are about to proceed on vacation. Uh, <laughs> and I just stole this time from your vacation calendar. CDPQ is doing a lot in India and we wish a very best to you and your team in India led by Anita George. Um, Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, and thank you very much to all of you for having listened to this. And I look forward to uh, my uh, visit to India very soon. Thank you very, very much. And uh, long, uh, you know, we we are just please remind, remember that CDPQ is there for a very long time in India. We're very excited to be there, and uh, we are, um, as we say in Canada, we're really open for business. Thank you very, very much. Thank you.